Hello and welcome to Arcadia University's histology course. Uh, we're taking a look at muscular tissues in this series of lectures and in part two we're going to take a look at the physiology. And so in the previous lecture we talked about the organization of the sarcomeres, the organization of uh, the myofilaments, the contractile uh, units in essence within a, a skeletal muscle cell. Now in this lecture we're going to look at how we control muscle contraction itself. So how do we go from the anatomy uh, and organization of the skeletal muscle units uh, into a physiological contractile uh, element, into the, the essentially the function. Now the first thing we need to do is take a, a brief look at how a muscle cell is going to be controlled. And so we're basically putting together our discussion of the nervous tissues in the previous sets of lectures with muscle cells that we're focusing in on today. And so what we're going to have is essentially a spinal cord motor neuron uh, is the, the classic example. So essentially a motor neuron, a cell body, which is going to extend out an axon into the periphery and it's going to connect up with muscle cells. So if we think about what we talked about with the nervous system lecture, we've got the axon that's going to go out. What I didn't say with the nerve cell uh, lecture is that these axons are then going to branch and they're going to make contact with a number of different targets. So you can have one motor neuron branching and making synaptic connections with a number of different targets. And so what this does then is allow us to have a motor unit. A motor unit is a single spinal cord neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it controls. And so what you can have is essentially one motor neuron and going out and making a connection with a lot of different muscle cells and what you would have is essentially a large motor unit. One spinal cord motor neuron and lots of muscle cells, many muscle cells. And this is going to be good for gross movement. And so the muscles of the back, the muscles in, in say the, the upper legs are, are going to be controlled by these large motor units. But for fine motor control, where you're essentially looking at movement of your fingers and movement of your uh, the, the fingertips, in essence, you want to have very um, very fine control, very uh, uh, kind of graded control about the strength and movement uh, of uh, your fingertips as opposed to say your legs or, or your back. And in that case you're going to have small motor units and so you're going to have still one spinal cord motor neuron but it's going to go through and essentially innervate or control many fewer muscle cells. And so that allows you then to have a very very finite, very regulated control of the muscle cells. So if we take a look at this, again, essentially pick up where we talked about uh, the transmission of electrical signals and chemical signals within the nervous system, we're essentially doing the same basic thing when we're taking a look at muscle contraction. We're going to start out with a nerve. And so we're going to have an action potential, which is going to be coming down the membrane it's going to spread across that presynaptic membrane, again presynaptic before the synapse, before the space, and it's going to be that spreading of the charge across that membrane is going to trigger the release of neurotransmitter. And so the neurotransmitters on this diagram are in the little synaptic vesicles, the little uh, purple dots uh, labeled three on this diagram. And so they're essentially going to be triggered to fuse with the presynaptic membrane through the process of exocytosis, dump out their neurotransmitter. And when we're talking about skeletal muscle, the neurotransmitter is going to be acetylcholine. That acetylcholine then is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft. So it's going to diffuse across the gap, like uh, you know molecules do within the body. And it's going to bind to receptors on the sarcolemma. So the acetylcholine released by the nerve cell, the presynaptic cell, is then going to bind to receptors on the muscle cell. And so when it binds to those receptors, it's going to cause ion channels to open. And when the ion channels open, it's going to cause depolarization of the sarcolemma, depolarization of the muscle membrane. And so basically what's going to happen, it's going to cause the ion channels to open up, ions are going to flow across the membrane, and as they do that, they're going to cause the charge, they're going to cause the voltage difference to change along this region of the cell. Now, still within the synaptic cleft, we're going to have acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase is going to be an enzyme which essentially breaks down acetylcholine 
essentially cleans out that synaptic space so that we can send another signal and allow for more muscle contraction to occur. So if we take a look at this, that depolarization on the sarcolemma, that depolarization on the muscle cell membrane is essentially going to trigger voltage-gated ion channels. That voltage difference, that electrical difference, that ion channel difference is going to trigger neighboring ion channels to open up. Okay, and what's going to happen then is that it's going to spread across the sarcolemma. It's going to spread across the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. Now, we said anatomically, we're going to have T-tubules. T-tubules are essentially extensions of that plasma membrane that, instead of moving down along the length of the membrane, are going to dive down into the muscle at the AI junction. And so when the membrane depolarizes, we're also going to depolarize the T-tubules. And so when the T-tubules depolarize, they're going to carry that charge, they're going to carry the, the flow of the ions into essentially the cytoplasm, the sarcoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell. And that's going to trigger the depolarization of the terminal cisternae. So it's going to cause the, term, the uh, depolarization or trigger gated channels, voltage gated channels, on the surface of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we're going to depolarize the terminal cisternae as part of that triad that we talked about in a previous mini lecture, and it's going to cause depolarization of the sarcoplasmic reticulum as a whole. What that means then is, in essence, we're going to trigger release of calcium. And so when the depolarization of the muscle membrane is going to spread down into the T tubules, it's going to cause a depolarization of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and we're going to release that sequestered calcium. Now, what happens then is that calcium then is going to be released into the sarcoplasm, into the cytoplasm of the, the skeletal muscle cell. It's going to bind to troponin. Okay, troponin, as a calcium binding protein, is going to bind to calcium and it's going to change its shape. And by changing its shape, it's basically going to move. And when it moves, it's going to drag tropomyosin along with it. And when it drags tropomyosin along with it, it's going to expose the active sites on the actin. It's going to expose the sites where the myosin head can interact with the actin. And so in essence, with calcium there, we're going to expose the actin and allow myosin to interact with the actin. Okay, so the, what we have then is the ability of the golf club shaped molecule, the yellow molecules that we're looking at it on this uh, uh, rendition on the, the right hand portion of the slide, looking at a single myosin molecule uh, undergoing these conformational, these shape changes. With the activation of ATPase on the myosin, we essentially energize that head and allow it to ratchet back and forth. And so when it's ratcheting back and forth, if it's attached to actin, when it ratchets, when it moves, it's going to drag the actin along with it. And it's basically going to pull that actin filament towards the center of the sarcomere. And so we need ATP, we need the binding of the myosin to the actin, but in doing so, that's going to allow that interaction and that conformational change, that shape change, is going to allow the movement of the actin and myosin in relationship to one another. Okay, so what we're going to have then is referred to as the sliding filament model. And so the interaction of the actin and myosin is going to cause the myosin heads to pull on those thin filaments and basically cause the Z line to be dragged towards the base of these myosin molecules. They're going to be dragged towards the A band. And so what's going to happen then is we're going to cause a shortening of the I band. We're going to cause a shortening of the thin filament only region. Not the, the thin filaments, not the actin getting shorter. It's just that they're going to be hidden by the thicker filaments. They're going to be hidden by the myosin containing filaments. But then when we do that, we're going to cause a shortening of the myofibrils. And if we shorten the sarcomere, we shorten the myofibrils, we're going to shorten this entire filament, and we're going to cause the entire muscle cell to shorten. And so we're going to have contraction, which is going to be occurring along the length of this muscle cell. 
Now, as these myofilaments are going to be shortening, they're essentially going to drag on, drag along whatever they're attached to. And so the myofilaments are going to be anchored to the cytoskeleton, and through the skeleton, they're going to be anchored to the sarcolemma or anchored to the muscle cell membrane. And so if we take a look at this in terms of the proteins, uh, the cytoskeletal proteins are going to be things like desmin as an intermediate filament. They're going to extend from the Z line, from that Z disc uh, of the sarcomere, and it's going to be connected to a variety of other cytoskeletal elements like plectin or uh, ultimately linked through dystropin, a molecule, to the plasma membrane, to the skeletal muscle cell membrane. And in doing so, they're going to anchor the sarcomeres, anchor these myofilaments to the membrane so that when the sarcomeres contract, the myofilaments contract, they're going to pull on that membrane and it cause the entire muscle to shorten. So if we take a look at something like muscular dystrophy, what happens is the connection between the myofilaments and the sarcolemma, the, the plasma membrane, is going to be weakened. And so in essence, what happens then is in muscular dystrophy, we have a variety of uh, disorders where we disrupt that dystrophic molecule, that kind of reddish molecule on the cartoon to the right-hand side. And in doing that, we've essentially disrupted that connection between the myofilaments and the membrane so that we can have contraction occurring of the myofilaments, but it's not going to correspond to contraction of the muscle. And so that's going to contribute to muscle weakness, can contribute to muscle atrophy, and it also is going to be contributing to damage to these muscle fibers, destruction of these muscle fibers. And so hopefully from this, we can see both the normal and the disease-related uh, contraction of the skeletal muscle unit. Now it's important to keep in mind that muscle contraction is a very energetic process. It requires lots and lots of ATP, ATP production. And so we're going to be looking at uh, essentially creatine phosphokinase uh, located within um, the regions of these sarcomeres, which is going to be involved with essentially transferring the energetic phosphate molecule from phosphocreatine to ADP to essentially continually regenerate ATP as that molecule. And that ATP is going to be important for two things. It's going to be important for causing the myosin movement, causing the, essentially the ratcheting movement of the head, and it's also going to be important for causing the myosin to release the actin. It's going to grab, myosin's going to grab the actin, the head's going to move, and then it needs to be able to release it and so that it can reattach and move it some more. Uh, so we need ATP for both of those functions. Uh, what happens in rigor mortis is essentially the myosin and the actin uh, essentially stay attached to one another because we don't have the, the ability to produce ATP uh, to cause a release from occurring, the release to occur. Okay, so that uh, finishes up our, our look at the physiology of skeletal muscle. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.